lugar, boa noite. Uh, me alegra muito o interesse de vocês. Eu sei que em novembro acontecem muitos encontros. Hoje mesmo, do pessoal da filosofia, tem um encontro sobre o Paulo Ricoeur. E há muitas atividades simultâneas. Tem um jogo do Luverdense contra o Colorado, que alguns talvez tenham preferido a essa palestra. Né? Mas, então, os que estão aqui terão, com certeza, uma bela e erudita, mas, ao mesmo tempo, muito agradável palestra de um ponto de vista de um pesquisador de Heidegger, mas com o um foco no objeto de estudo de Heidegger, que é Kierkegaard. Ah, o título, Uma Nova Perspectiva, Uh, se refere ao fato, eu já estou antecipando, ao fato de que o uh, Dr. Gerhard Tonhauser, de Viena, ele apresenta uma leitura muito completa de Heidegger, ou seja, ele leva em conta as dezenas, quase centena, né, uma centena de volumes da Gesamtausgabe. Então, existia uma lenda de que Heidegger escondia o jogo e nunca citava Kierkegaard, mas, ou citava-se muito parcamente, e Gerhard Tonhauser já percebeu que existem livros em que Heidegger analisa Kierkegaard durante 60 páginas seguidas, como no, no volume 49, nas lições sobre a metafísica do idealismo alemão, quando ele se refere a Schelling. Então, a nova perspectiva significa uma leitura assim, muito vasta, muito completa do Heidegger, encontrando várias posições pró e contra Kierkegaard e algumas muito antes pelo contrário também. É? Eu queria apresentar, assim, muito simplesmente, nosso professor Gerhard Tonhauser, ele é austríaco, estudou em Viena. O orientador do mestrado e do doutorado dele, Helmut Vetter, vocês talvez já tenham ouvido falar, se vocês leem alguma coisa de Heidegger, porque o Vetter é o editor do volume uh, História da Filosofia de Tomás de Aquino a Kant. Uh, um volume que o tem dificuldades, porque o Heidegger não gostava muito de dar cursos assim panorâmicos, então ele trabalha bastante Tomás de Aquino, depois vai diminuindo assim, e, né, não é como os professores da Unicinos, que dão 15 autores num semestre. Mas então o professor Helmut Vetter foi um, um grande orientador, e nós temos então, como resultado dos trabalhos de Gerhard Tonhauser, por exemplo, a dissertação de mestrado retrabalhada über das Konzept der Zeitlichkeit bei Sir Kierkegaard mit ständigem Hinblick auf Martin Heidegger, quer dizer, sobre o conceito de temporalidade em Søren Kierkegaard com constante referência a Heidegger. Né? Quer dizer, esse título, constante referência a Heidegger, soa a tese do Kierkegaard né, em constante referência a Sócrates. Portanto, é, propositalmente... Um, já é um debate, um, uma pesquisa dupla uh, sobre esses dois autores, e isto é apenas um trabalho de mestrado, vocês se entusiasmem aí, os que ainda não fizeram mestrado, e os que já fizeram mestrado, eu queria mostrar aqui para vocês o, a tese de doutorado, um pouco retrabalhada como livro, mas uh, o título é Hetzelhaftes Zeichen, quer dizer, um sinal enigmático. Isso é uma citação de, de Heidegger, quando ele diz, numa das suas lições, uh, Nietzsche e Kierkegaard, mas também outros autores, outros pensadores, são sinais enigmáticos, uh, para quem não existe propriamente uma categoria. Quer dizer, uh, ele tem até uma palestra, um, um artigo, se vocês quiserem ler em inglês, Uh, thinker without category, não são pensadores sem categoria, no sentido de desqualificados, mas são 
pensadores para os quais ainda não existe uma categoria adequada. Obrigado, viu? Muito obrigado. Então, este livro é a tese, então o subtítulo é sobre a relação de Martin Heidegger e Søren Kierkegaard. Né? Uh, além disso, ele também, como os alemães e os europeus em geral não estudam uma coisa só especializada, ele também é formado em ciências políticas. Então, ele é editor de dois textos, pelo menos, um é Perspectivas com Heidegger, né? Zugänge, Pfade, Anknüpfungen, quer dizer, relações, né? trilhas e acessos, né? o acesso, e também em inglês, From Conventionalism to Social Authenticity, né? que é do o N1 do Heidegger, né? e a teoria social contemporânea. Contemporânea. Então, é também o interesse dele esse aspecto social, até a pesquisa, o lado social, o político-social de Heidegger, isso é uma coisa bem interessante. Né? Então, vocês aqui têm uma ideia dos interesses do professor, da capacidade do raciocínio, da argumentação, vocês logo terão uma prova. É uma grande alegria, uma grande alegria, uma grande alegria tê-lo aqui. Vou levá-lo amanhã a São Paulo para a jornada de Kierkegaard. Né? E tenho que agradecer né, a colaboração que nós estamos tendo aqui, do pessoal da, do Vicentini, da instituição, e também o, a descoberta dos primeiros textos que nós lemos do Tony Hauser, o Gabriel descobriu em inglês, nós já lemos, já traduzimos e tal, em parte. Então, esperamos que esta seja a primeira vinda. Wir hoffen, dass der erste Besuch nach Brasilien, nicht der letzte. E aí, eu só não disse ainda que ele deixou a Áustria, trocou pela Universidade Livre de Berlim, onde ele está agora lecionando. Então, vejam que tem uma carreira promissora, recém começando, e já tem muito a contribuir conosco. Nós estamos gratos, né? nós agradecemos muito. Né? Então, eu vou dar logo a palavra para o professor, e agradecendo a presença, a atenção... Uh, eu quero chamar a atenção, eu mesmo traduzi do inglês o que o professor escreveu, ele vai falar em inglês, porque aí vocês uh, entendem praticamente tudo, e eu, em qualquer dúvida, é só olhar na tela, uh, a minha tradução não é uma tradução definitiva, mas eu fiz com cuidado, e em casos duvidosos, eu procurei ler no texto do Heidegger, então eu acho que é uma coisa relativamente confiável, fiel, né? mas não substitui naturalmente a palestra em inglês e, ao final, depois de uma hora e pouco, nós teremos tempo de algumas perguntas, se quiserem, o interesse de vocês é que vai mandar. Aí eu vou pedir um apoio maior para o Vicentini, para o inglês, ou se precisar alguma coisa no alemão, eu posso quebrar o galho, tá? Então, muito obrigado. Uh, agradeço aos outros professores, aos alunos de doutorado, de, de graduação que estão aqui. Vamos começar, né? Yeah, um, I, I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, it's my first time in Brazil, and I've enjoyed every single minute of it so far. So it's a brilliant time I've had here. I um, also want to thank uh, Alvaro um, for all the work he did with translating my talk. So I'm pretty sure that the talk you are able to read is is better than what I am reading in English. Um, And finally, uh, I noticed that there is apparently a lot of competition with like other conferences on Ricoeur, and, and also I thank you very much um, for being here um, in, in this room. And yeah, some of you already got to know, and I hope to get to know um, more of you. Um, okay, so let's um, start. So throughout his authorship, Martin Heidegger made a number of seemingly contradictory statements about Søren Kierkegaard. Some statements are outright dismissive. As early as 1923, Heidegger states in a lecture course, the pertinacity of dialectic, which draws its motivation from a very definite source, 
is documented most clearly in Kierkegaard. In the properly philosophical aspect of his thought, he did not break free from Hegel. His later turn to Trendelenburg is only added documentation for how little radical he was in philosophy. He did not realize that Trendelenburg saw Aristotle through the lens of Hegel. His reading the paradox into the New Testament and things Christian was simply negative Hegelianism. Probably better known is a similar statement from Heidegger's major work, Being and Time. In the 19th century, Kierkegaard explicitly grasped and thought through the problem of existence as existential in a penetrating way. But the existential problematic is so foreign to him that in an ontological regard, he is completely under the influence of Hegel and his view of ancient philosophy. In the lecture course, What is Thinking, from 1952, Heidegger repeats his point about Kierkegaard's dependence on Hegel and Aristotle. By way of Hegelian metaphysics, Kierkegaard remains everywhere philosophically entangled. On the one hand, in a dogmatic Aristotelianism that is completely au bas with medieval scholasticism, and on the other hand, in the subjectivity of German idealism. These statements appear to suggest that nothing new is to be found in the work of the Danish thinker. Reading Kierkegaard could thus appear as a waste of time. However, there are other statements that paint a much more favorable picture of Kierkegaard. To cite, to cite just one prominent example, a few years after being in time, Heidegger had changed his mind regarding Kierkegaard. In being in time, he explained, in line with the sketch dismissal, that Kierkegaard understood the moment with the help of now and eternity, and thereby failed to achieve an appropriate understanding of temporality. But now in this lecture course, Heidegger states the exact opposite. What we here designate as um, the moment or Augenblick in German is what was, was really comprehended for the first time in philosophy by Kierkegaard, a comprehending with which the possibility of a completely new epoch of philosophy has begun for the first time since antiquity. In a sharp contrast to his previous statement, Heidegger now claims that Kierkegaard was the first one to grasp the important notion of Augenblick which became a crucial element of Heidegger's understanding of temporality as developed in being in time. Heidegger adds to this statement um, a repudiation of contemporary interpretations of Kierkegaard. I say this is a possibility. For today, when Kierkegaard has become fashionable, for whatever reasons, we have reached a stage where the literature about Kierkegaard and everything connected with it has ensured in all kinds of ways that this decisive point of Kierkegaard's philosophy has not been comprehended. Um, a semester before, Heidegger made a similar claim. Um, he wrote, um, we cannot speak about the further significance of Kierkegaard here. His true significance is something which one cannot talk or write books about, and which is concealed most of all from the literature. The second half of the 1920s was indeed a time um, in which a massive amount of literature on Kierkegaard was published in Germany. This led some to label this time as a Kierkegaard Renaissance. From Heidegger's point of view, it is better not to read most of these texts, as they present a distorted image of Kierkegaard. And from what I've read during my research into the history of the German-speaking reception of Kierkegaard, I tend to agree with, with Heidegger's assessment. Um, Heidegger is particularly critical of interpretations that find a close proximity between his thought and that of Kierkegaard. On the one hand, this is surely because Heidegger was always keen on establishing and maintaining the uniqueness of his own thought, especially in cases where his work is probably not, not as original as he wants us to believe. In a manuscript from 1941, however, Heidegger adds a remarkable twist to this narrative. He states that the conflation of his thought with Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's thought has not has now also caused that above all the historical essence of Kierkegaard remains concealed. This essence only becomes knowable if the apprehension forbears to apply as scales, scheme, and sparagons of a theology or from philosophers. In comparison, the harm of a misinterpretation of being and time is minor. In a number of statements, Heidegger combines dismissal and endorsement of Kierkegaard. To provide a well-known example, Consider the much discussed passage in Nietzsche's war, word, God is Dead, from 1943, where Heidegger states, Kierkegaard is not a thinker, but a religious writer. And not just one religious writer among others, but the only one who accords with the destiny of his age. His greatness lies in this fact. 
Unless talking this way is already a misunderstanding. Um, this passage aligns with a number of cryptic remarks about Kierkegaard from the 1930s and 1940s. And another example is a passage from Contributions to Philosophy. Heidegger writes there under the heading Hölderlin Kierkegaard Nietzsche. Let no one today be so presumptuous as to take it as a mere coincidence that these three, who each in his own way, in the end suffer profoundly the uprooting to which Western history is being driven and who at the same time intimidated their gods most intimately. Yeah, intimidated their gods most intimately. Um, that these three had to depart from the brightness of their days prematurely. Contributions to philis philosophy has been written around um, 1936. In the lecture course from winter term 1937-38, Heidegger includes Kierkegaard in a list with Schiller, Hölderlin, Van Gogh, and Nietzsche, telling his students that these names are like enigmatic signs inscribed into the most concealed ground of our history. So that's where I took the title of the, of the book from. Um, so these passages raise a lot of questions. Um, what is Kierkegaard, among the other writers mentioned, in particular Nietzsche and Hölderlin, an enigmatic sign for? And coming back to the passage um, from Nietzsche's word, God is dead, in what sense is he in accord with the destiny of each age? So, der seinem Zeitalter, or das Geschick seines Zeitalters gemäße. Um, how should we understand that he suffered profoundly the uprooting to which Western history is being driven? Um, at the beginning of the 1930s, Heidegger located Kierkegaard together with Nietzsche outside the path of Western philosophy. In Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, a new way of thinking out manifested itself, something beyond existing categories like philosophy or theology, a way of thinking that cannot be grasped yet, but remains a sign for a future to come. In Heidegger's words, from another lecture course from the middle of the 1930s, everything that comes after Hegel is not philosophy anymore, not even Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. These two are no philosophers, but rather human beings without category who only la later times will grasp. So this um, statement reiterates the importance of the question. So what was Kierkegaard precisely assigned for? And uh, what, what was Kierkegaard's thought all about? Um, in a passage from a lecture course um, from 1928, Heidegger gave one of the more lucid statements about the relationship of his thought with that of Kierkegaard. His purpose is not ours, but differs in principle, something which does not prevent us from learning from him, but obliges us to learn what he has to offer. But Kierkegaard never pushed onward into the dimension of the problematic, which is the existential analysis of Dasein as fundamental ontology, because it was not important for him. And his work as an author had a completely different basic purpose that also required different ways and means. But even this statement remains rather cryptic. Heidegger emphasizes that his basic purpose is completely different from the basic purpose of Kierkegaard. Whereas it is clear what Heidegger saw as his own basic purpose, reintroducing the question of being against the oblivion of being, he does not tell us what he sees as the basic purpose of Kierkegaard's thought. Until recently, there was no textual basis for a mo more detailed interpretation of Heidegger's take on that matter. This situation, situation has changed with the publication of Heidegger's so-called black notebooks, um, because these notebooks include um, one entry from 1941 entitled My Relation to Kierkegaard, Mein Verhältnis zu Kierkegaard. In this note of approximately two pages length, Heidegger elaborates on his understanding of Kierkegaard in a fashion that enables us to develop a framework for interpreting other, more cryptic statements. I will thus take a few minutes to provide you with a summary of that entry. So Heidegger begins the note by stating that he has never spoken about his relationship to Kierkegaard. And this is because um, this would only be possible via an engagement with Kierkegaard as a religious thinker. Um, this is in line with several other statements and will be one of the crucial line of thoughts that I will come back to later. Heidegger continues by addressing the claim that he had borrowed from Kierkegaard while ignoring the Christian element, thereby making his existential analysis into an atheist, the, atheistic abuse of Kierkegaard. Um, Heidegger replies to that challenge that his that this claim presupposes that the leading question in Heidegger's writings and in being and time are the same. 
which would make being in time into kind of a secularized version of Kierkegaard. Heidegger refuses this preposition by emphasizing the unique question of being in time, which is foreign not only to Kierkegaard, but to all metaphysics, that is, the entire history of Western thought. Heidegger then proceeds to question why Kierkegaard nevertheless appeared to feature so prominently in being in time. Heidegger replies, this is the case because in Kierkegaard we find an attempt of understanding selfhood in an, an, in an essential way. Kierkegaard grasped the issue of selfhood in a decisive fashion, which allowed Heidegger to build on him for his existential analysis. However, Heidegger continues to claim that Kierkegaard addressed the issue of selfhood within the framework of occidental metaphysics, more specifically on the basis of the modern notion of subjectivity in its highest form, the form found in German idealism. This appears to be the deeper reason why Heidegger claims that Kierkegaard remained a Hegelian. In the following sentence, Heidegger explicates what sets Kierkegaard apart from German idealism as well as from Heidegger himself. The purpose of, Kierkegaard's, uh, the purpose of Kierkegaard is Christian salvation. Um, unfortunately, Heidegger does not say more about this purpose, like what does it mean that his purpose is Christian salvation. Instead, he continues to explain his, the purpose of his own work. He writes that being in time concerns a different question, the question of being. The question of being should not be seen as Christian or anti-Christian. Heidegger sees it as located outside of Christianity, as well as outside of metaphysics. Although the question of being requires a reflection on the selfhood of the human being, Heidegger claims that he addresses selfhood in a way that, is left that has left behind the horizon of subjectivity. He has achieved this by approaching selfhood in terms of Tarsein. After this clarification regarding his own project, Heidegger comes back to Kierkegaard and repeats a statement from being in time. He writes that philosophically, more is to be learned from Kierkegaard's edifying writings. And he explains that this is the case because these writings address the existential domain the question of being a self and not Hege Hegelian metaphysics. Again, Heidegger is more interested in clarifying his own thought than explaining what his opinion about Kierkegaard is. Thus, he continues by claiming that in being in time, Kierkegaard's notion of the self is read more primordially by approaching it in light of a preparation for the truth of being out of the knowledge about Dasein. The last but one sentence states that Karl Jasper's work could rightfully be considered a secular, secular, secularization of Kierkegaard, insofar as Jaspers assumes Kierkegaard's basic premise of theologically affirming transcendence, although Jaspers does not enact it as a faithful Christian. Heidegger ends his note by repeating that nothing like that is to be found in being in time, and complains that his work has been denounced as atheistic. Such a conviction fails to see, Heidegger concludes, that the question of being relocates the whole of metaphysics and theology outside the realm of, existential, uh, of the essential decisions. So this note touches upon, upon so many themes that it's impossible to address them all in one talk. And for the talk today, I decided to focus on an interpre interpretation of the passage from um, Nietzsche's word, God is dead, according to which Kierkegaard is a religious writer who accords with the destiny of his age. So this text was published in 1943, so two years after the note, My Relation to Kierkegaard. And another important source for the interpretation I will offer here is the lecture course on Schelling's freedom essay, which Heidegger gave in the summer term of 1941. Um, and this course opens, so it's a course on Schelling, but it opens with a 60-page discussion of the terms ground and existence um, with, where Kierkegaard is the main point of res reference. And, and finally, I will make use of the, the black notebooks like written in the years after, where we also find like a number of comments on faith and Kierkegaard. So this, this would be the period I'm in, in, mostly interpreting, like at the beginning of the 1940s. So let, let's quote the, the passage I, I want to give an explanation of. Um, it has become a customary practice through not less problematic for being customary, to just oppose Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. But this just opposition fails to recognize the essence of Nietzsche's thinking. It therefore fails to see that Nietzsche, as a metaphysical thinker, preserved a proximity to Aristotle. Although he cites Aristotle more often, Kierkegaard is essentially distanced from him. For Kierkegaard is not a thinker, but a religious writer, and not just one relig religious writer among others, but the only one who accords with the destiny of his age. His greatness lies in this fact, 
and less talking in this way is already a misunderstanding. Um, the discussion has often been around the question whether a re religious writer is an appropriate way of addressing Kierkegaard. Many consider this a sign of Heidegger holding Kierkegaard in low esteem. I don't think that this is the relevant question. To begin with, it can be pointed out that religious writer is basically just an iteration of Kierkegaard's self-description in the point of view from a work as an author. Um, Kierkegaard writes there, the content then of this little book is what I in truth am as an author, that I am and was a religious author, that my whole authorship pertains to Christianness, to the issue becoming a, becoming a Christian, with direct and indirect polemical aim at that enormous illusion, Christianity, or the illusion that in such a country all Christians, all are Christians of sorts. So there's probably also an issue of translation at play here. So Kierkegaard uses the Danish word for feather, um, and it's appropriate to translate for feather into English as author rather than writer because it's the more neutral term. In German, however, um, this option is not available as both autor and schriftsteller have like the connotation of literary production rather than scholarly production. So in German translations of Kierkegaard, it's most common to use the word Schriftsteller, um, as one can already see like in the translation of the title of the book. So it's for me for feather wirksamheit in Danish, and it's für meine Wirksamkeit als Schriftsteller in German. Um, and Heidegger appears to follow the wording of the German translation and speaks of Kierkegaard as a re religiöser Schriftsteller. In the English, English translation of Heidegger's text, this has been translated as re religious writer rather than religious author, um, as the English translation of Kierkegaard's text would suggest. But in, in addition to these semantic shifts due to a translation, um, I think it's important that one needs to factor in that at the time when Heidegger wrote that remark, he used philosophy and, and theology as well with negative connotations. So they are expressions of the metaphysical tradition that needs to be overcome. And the main resources for this overcoming for Heidegger are poetry and thinking, so dichten und denken. Um, thus it is more remarkable that Heidegger is convinced that Kierkegaard should not be considered a philosopher or a theologian. Um, and in the lecture course on Schelling, Heidegger explains that explicitly. So Kierkegaard is a religious thinker that is not a theologian and not a Christian philosopher. Kierkegaard is more theological than a Christian theologian and more unphilosophical than a metaphysical thinker could ever be. He must remain standing on his own. Neither theology nor philosophy can rank him in their history. So following this passage, the intriguing question is, what does Heidegger see as Kierkegaard's unique position in which he needs to remain standing on his own? To answer this question, we need to address two issues. First, we need to discuss how Heidegger contextualizes Kierkegaard in the history of being in particular, this will require us to consider Heidegger's view on Kierkegaard's relation to Hegel and Kierkegaard's relation to Nietzsche. And this will provide the basis for a discussion of Heidegger's view on Kierkegaard's unique position. What does Heidegger mean when talking about Kierkegaard as a religious writer? What makes Kierkegaard accord with the destiny of his age? Discuss discussing these questions will in the end lead us to an investigation of Heidegger's view on Kierkegaard as a Christian writer. So during the 1930s and 40s, the period we, I'm focusing on here, Heidegger was invested in a project of a history of being, so a science Geschichte. The term history of being might appear strange to those not familiar with the thought of the later Heidegger. To get a rough idea of what the history of being is about, it's best to start with the end. Heidegger argues that philosophy has come to its completion. With philosophy, Heidegger denotes the tradition of thought that started in ancient Greece and dominated the West, or what Heidegger refers to call the Abendland, the evening land, um, through the centuries. In modernity, um, philosophy has dissolved into particular sciences and technologies. In this proce process, being has become questionless. The question of being does not speak to us anymore. This is the case because a particular understanding of being has become so dominant that it has become incomprehensible for us how entities could be experienced otherwise. Heidegger calls this way in which entities are encountered Machenschaft, translated into English as machina ma imagination, and, and later Gestell, translated as enframing. 
So in the age of Machenschaft or Gestell, all entities are disclosed within a mathematical, technological, and economic frame. Heidegger integrates the diagnosis of our age into a grand history of Western thought, which sees this tradition as a progressive history of the oblivion of being, science vergessenheit. Um, his aim is to diagnose the oblivion of being and to prepare for another period to come in the overcoming of Machenschaft or Gestell. And it's important to note here this overcoming for him. Uh, so overcoming translates Verwindung, um, which means not simply, simply to leave behind or to an annihilate, but rather to go beyond something by turning it around. So that's the idea of Verwindung, which is turning around and, and overcoming. Um, Heidegger developed this line of thought um, mostly in texts that weren't published during his lifetime. Um, so mostly these eight volumes of the Gesamtausgabe, um, written um, from 1936 onwards. Um, but we can see that um, the history of being like started already like at the beginning of the 1930s. Um, and in this early period, Kierkegaard gets mentioned quite frequently and appears to find a position within the history of, of being. Um, and this was also publicly visible at the time through a number of lecture courses and public lectures. And in contrast to that, Heidegger get, uh, Kierkegaard gets hardly mentioned um, in the second half of the 1930s. So there was a shift, and that's what I'm going to um, point out now in the following um, sections of my talk. But one element that stayed the same throughout Heidegger's intellectual development is his view on Kierkegaard's relation to Hegel. If we reconsider the first passage I quoted in this talk, we can see that Heidegger, as early as 1923, claimed that Kierkegaard remained dependent on Hegel and that his critique was a form of negative Hegelianism. Heidegger sees two main signs um, for Kierkegaard's continued dependence on Hegel. First, Heidegger claims that Kierkegaard engaged with the history of philosophy through Hegelian lens. I'm not going to talk about that today. And second, he relied on an understanding of subjectivity developed by German idealism. And that's what I want to focus on now. Um, in his lecture course on Schelling from 1941, Heidegger explains to his students, Kierkegaard thinks about the human being in the sense of subjectivity that German idealism has developed conceptually. Another elaboration on this aspect can be found about a decade earlier in a lecture course on German idealism from summer term 1929. Heidegger explains that Kierkegaard's striving for a Christian anthropology does not change the fact that the premises of his thought are based on German idealism. Kierkegaard simply replaced the idealist, idealistic subject with the Christian notion of the human being. In do, doing so, he never got past the antithesis of reality and ideality, substantiality and subjectivity. He did not even take the problem to the same height as in German idealism. So Heidegger does not only claim that Kierkegaard remained dependent upon Hegel, he also thinks that this, his criticism of Hegel is, philosophically speaking, inadequate and unwarranted. This becomes particularly clear in his lecture course on Schelling. Heidegger raises the question why Kierkegaard attacks Hegel for thinking abstractly and thereby failing to grasp existence. He claims that everyone with knowledge of Hegel's philosophy can recognize that one of its main aims is to avoid thinking abstractly or to think concretely instead. In which sense is it then that Kierkegaard ch can charge Hegel for thinking abstractly? Heidegger explains it the following way. While Hegel and Kierkegaard both dismiss abstract thinking, they do so on the basis of different understandings of abstract. For Hegel, thinking abstractly means thinking one-sidedly, that is, only in one direction of consciousness not considering the entire determination of a thing. For Kierkegaard, in contrast, abstract thinking is remote thinking, thinking that is detached from existence and reigns in a metaphysical realm, thus thinking without taking the thinking being um, up into its thought. And Heidegger summarizes the relationship of Kierkegaard and Hegel in the following way. The contradiction of Kierkegaard and Hegel is in fact the contradiction of a faithful Christian in the Kierkegaardian sense and the absolute metaphysics of German idealism, which for its part again was convinced that it first lifted up the truth of Christianity to the absolute truth of absolute knowledge. From Heidegger's point of view, a mutual misunderstanding of Kierkegaard and German idealism cannot be avoided because it is based on a mutual incapacity to grasp the other's position in its internal reasoning. 
Kierkegaard's Christian must necessarily oppose the metaphysics of German idealism because he has no part in it, since in um, since it only consists of abstract thinking in Kierkegaard's sense. On the other hand, German idealism is committed to the self-image uh, of guiding Christianity into its absolute truth. Therefore, it cannot grasp Kierkegaard's objection from the perspective of the single individual. Such an, such an object, objection must appear to it as an abstraction in the idealistic sense, a one-sidedness. In a later part of the lecture course, Heidegger explains that Kierkegaard does not belong to the history of philosophy and his fight against the system has a different meaning. He adds this remark to the discussion of Nietzsche's critique of German idealism. Thus, to get a better grasp of Heidegger's way of situating Kierkegaard in the history of philosophy, we need to take a closer look at his view on the relation of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Whereas Heidegger's assessment of Kierkegaard's relation to Nietzsche remained the same throughout his authorship, his view on the relation of Kierkegaard uh, and Nietzsche was imp So Hegel's re the relation between Kierkegaard and Hegel like, remained the same, um, but Heidegger's understanding of the relation between Kierkegaard and Nietzsche saw important transformations. And the topic first got Heidegger's attention at the beginning of the 1930s, around the time when Heidegger began to be interested in Nietzsche. Um, the beginning of the 1930s was a period in which Heidegger frequently, frequently mentioned Kierkegaard and Nietzsche together, emphasizing um, their similarities and highlighting both as these enigmatic signs for a future to come. And I've already quoted several of the, of the passages in the introduction of my talk. So at the beginning of the 1930s, Heidegger locates Kierkegaard and Nietzsche outside of philosophy. In them, a new way of thinking manifested itself something beyond existing categories like philosophy, which cannot be grasped yet, remaining a sign for a future to come. In the middle of the 1930s, Heidegger changed his view. This shift had less to do with a modified opinion about Kierkegaard and more with the further development of the history of being. We can see a first sign of this in the winter tour of 1933, when Heidegger gave his first lecture course on Hölderlin. From this point on, Kierkegaard is mentioned less frequently, while Hölderlin's importance for Heidegger grows. In addition, a modified reaching of Nietzsche makes Nietzsche the main subject of Heidegger's lecture courses between 1936 and 1941. During those years, Heidegger considered Nietzsche, Nietzsche's the will to power as the completion of metaphysics. As a consequence, Heidegger includes Nietzsche in the history of being as the final step in the oblivion of being, whereas Kierkegaard continues to be excluded from metaphysics. In Contributions to Philosophy, he states, what lies between Hegel and Nietzsche has many shapes, but is nowhere within the metaphysical in any originary sense, not even Kierkegaard. In the same year, so 1936, Heidegger gave a first lecture course on Schelling, not to be confused with the second lecture course from 1941. Um, in this lecture course, um, he explained, Nietzsche's attitude towards um, the system is fundamentally different from that of Kierkegaard, who is usually mentioned here together with Nietzsche. All of this is said, um, by the way, in order to show by implication that the combination of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, which has become customary, is justified in many ways, but is fundamentally untrue philosophically and is misleading. So to sum up, Heidegger's focus on the history of being in the second half of the 30s resulted in Nietzsche becoming his main reference author. Kierkegaard was identified as playing no role in the history of being. In the context of the history of being, all Heidegger has to say about Kierkegaard is that Kierkegaard's fight against the system has a different meaning. And I think we are now in a position to see that this is the context of the passage from Nietzsche's word, God is dead. And I think the first half of the passage repeats Heidegger's view on Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, emphasizing their very different roles in the history of being. So Nietzsche is an integral part of this history, while Kierkegaard cannot be properly understood within this narrative. Um, the second half tries to elaborate on Kierkegaard's unique position. And this is where he says that um, he was the only religious writer 
who accords with the destiny of his age. And I think Alvaro was like quite right in pointing out that this is actually not a good translation. So I took it from the official translation, but the German says, um, der, dem Geschick seines Zeitalters gemäße, and like being gemäß, like translate badly as being in accordance with, because in accordance me with means to align with something and to, to be gemäß means more to be at the height of one's time. So um, th thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, in what follows, um, now I will try to suggest a perspective that will allow us to make more sense of this statement. Uh, I want to point out um, that my aim here is not to provide definite answers. So in general, like all the work I've done in Heidegger and Kegel is more about like pointing out to all the relevant passages and like, how many there are and like, you know, thereby allowing us to discuss these questions like on, on the height of the complexity um, that they have. So I want to open a discussion rather than close it and, and hope that you help me like get a better grasp of what's like content-wise going on here. Um, so let me remind you of a few important thoughts from my relation to Kierkegaard, this, this note from the Black Notebooks. Heidegger claims that in, in Kierkegaard, we find an attempt of understanding selfhood in an essential way. Um, however, Kierkegaard did so on the basis of the modern notion of subjectivity in its highest form, the form found in German idealism. Um, but we've also seen that Heidegger claims that Kierkegaard has to be situated outside the history of being. One possible way of explicating this is by saying um, that this is the case because Kierkegaard broke with the aim of achieving universality that is characteristic of metaphysics. The highest expression of this strife for universality is the attempt of German idealism to bring Christianity to its metaphysical completion. Based on that project, German idealists had to consider the perspective of the single individual as a one-sided element in the system. In my relation to Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Heidegger identifies the basic purpose of Kierkegaard's thought as aiming at Christian salvation. And that's important to know, it's Christliches Heil, German. So um, it, that cannot be translated into English. I don't know if you have like, probably a better way of expressing that in, in Portuguese that makes it, uh, like, gives a better idea of what, what, what Heil means here. It also works well in Danish, where they have the word Heil, Heile, which has the same meaning of being whole and being um, healthy, like all these, these connotations that Heil has. Um, this orientation towards the salvation of the single individual placed Kierkegaard in sharp opposition with German idealism. From Heidegger's point of view, however, this opposition is not of philosophical significance, but needs to be seen from a different perspective. As Heidegger already wrote in the 20s, Kierkegaard never pushed onward into the dimension of the ontological question Heidegger was interested in, question of being in the various formulations it found in Heidegger. Instead, his works as an author had a completely different basic purpose that also required different ways and means. Um, we cannot make sense of these statements if we do not engage with Heidegger's view on Kierkegaard as a religious and indeed Christian writer. And as he noted in another entry in the Black Notebooks, he said, but Kierkegaard is a probably unfaithful Christian writer who cannot be accommodated in any category, since he himself first developed the category suitable for him. Now the problem is that Heidegger hardly ever talked about Kierkegaard's Christianity. In a certain sense, this can be said about Christianity in general. So Heidegger developed elaborate criticism of ontotheology, and uses the term ontotheology to um, identify the position that identifies God as the highest being um, or the highest entity. From Heidegger's point of view, this is a sign of the oblivion of being in metaphysics. But Heidegger hardly ever talked about the possibility of religion beyond ontotheology. Um, and one explanation could be that Heidegger saw a clear division of labor between philosophy and religion, thinking and faith, and situating himself clearly on the side of thinking. Um, and this is in line with the statement where he says that Kierkegaard's true significance is someone, something which one cannot talk or write books about. Um, thus remaining silent on the issue of faith and, and Christianity. Um, so in, in, in the black notebooks, and, and prob probably let's say I, I always stick to this, um, like labeling these books black notebooks, um, but this is really just because um, they, so they were like notebooks that had a black cover, and that's like why, why they kind of as a, 
slang word uh, 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 called like black notebooks. So Heidegger himself called the text, um, the first ones, Überlegungen, which has been translated to English as ponderings. And later he, he called it Anmerkungen, so remarks. So it's you know, much less serious than what you think of, like these black books. So and then we, we had a discussion that probably like the translation as, um, as uh, what is it? Like, like it, yeah, that it should be maybe just pretos and not negros to make just, yeah, it's, it's just the color of, uh, of the cover. Um, there's nothing more to it. Um, but in, in these infamous books, um, we, we find a number of entries likely written um, between 46 and 48 um, uh, that shed some light on Heidegger's view on Christian faith and particularly on Kierkegaard. And let me begin with a note entitled Faith and Thinking. In this note, Heidegger emphasizes that thinking and faith are divided by a fissure. Heidegger sees a fundamental misunderstanding in the attempt of theologians to mediate this fissure. Heidegger claims that such a mediation cannot be desired from the, perspe from the perspective of faith, for faith requires a leap, and the leap is only possible where the fissure is. Um, and in a move that contains a lot of bustling elements, Heidegger explains explains that the fissure between faith and thinking cannot be established from faith sides. So and this, this is like this quote that is really obscure, I think. Um, but the fissure between faith and thinking can also never arise from faith, for faith is only concerned with the salvation of the soul, but never with beings as such in their being. Faith considers to, thinking to be foolishness. Faith, there is only Christian faith, does not concern itself with thinking and does not attend to what is to be thought as such. Regarding thinking, faith is even indifferent to its separation from thinking. Faith can neither be the fissure of thinking, nor can it be concerned with thinking. So without aspiration of providing a comprehensive uh, uh, interpretation of this passage, let me provide a few clarificatory remarks. And I leave aside the question of a remark that all faith is Christian faith, uh, and focus on, on his remarks on the relation of faith and thinking. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that for Heidegger, um, thinking has a different meaning than philosophy. Um, so in this note, Heidegger writes from the perspective of the overcoming of metaphysics. And the important point is like thinking stands here in opposition to metaphysics. So it's like thinking is like the overcoming of metaphysics. Um, um, the second point is that it's still an open task um, for research to determine the status of the black notebooks. Um, so Heidegger's thinking of the 30s and 40s is documented in several layers of texts, and they could, I, I want to distinguish them here according to like the level of publicity. Um, so first, there are texts like Nietzsche's word, God is Dead, which were published during Heidegger's lifetime. Second, there were the lecture courses that had like a form of publicity of their own. Um, and third, there are like these manuscripts, like contributions to philosophy, um, which were m clearly meant and prepared for um, posthumous um, um, publication. And finally, there is the layer of the black notebooks, and, and they are clearly the most esoteric texts. Um, and Heidegger also speaks more frankly in these texts than in others. Um, and the result is also a number of these disturbing remarks that have been so much discussed um, for you know, remarks on, on Jews, but, but also on many other nations um, where Heidegger speaks, speaks in ways that sometimes do not make sense and sometimes it's just like terrible prejudices. Um, um, so th but this may also be the reason why Heidegger thinks that he can speak here from a perspective of thinking after the overcoming of metaphysics, that he wouldn't be able to speak in, in like more public works. Um, but however that may be, um, so it's important to see this opposition of philosophy and, and thinking. And, and now the intriguing element is um, that um, Heidegger sees philosophy and theology also as enemies of faith. So thus thinking and faith uh, might be seen as allies of sorts because they have the um, same opponent, um, which, which is um, theology and philosophy, metaphysics. Um, Another element worthy of note um, is the implicit reference to um, the first epistle of the um, Corinthians. Uh, and there, um, 
we read that the message of Christ is an offense to Jews and foolishness to pagans. And this, of course, has been a major topic for Kierkegaard, for example, in the appendix um, Offensive to the Paradox and Acoustic Illusion in Philosophical Fragments. And I skip over like, the, the remark on, on translation. Um, and the puzzling element for, for Heidegger's note um, that this Heidegger turns this around. So, so for Paulus and Kierkegaard, of course, it was Christianity um, that is foolishness to pagans. But Heidegger says that thinking is foolishness to faith. Um, and I, I don't know if there's anything meaningful in that, so maybe some, one of you has a suggestion on that, or whether that was just Heidegger's um, psychological condition um, at this time, like uh, after the end of the Second World War. Um, I'm, I'm skipping to the next um, section. Um, the note faith and thinking is followed by a note entitled Christianity and Christianness. Heidegger emphasizes again the fissure between faith and thinking. He repeats the statement that thinking is a foolishness to faith and adds that faith is the impossible for thinking. In the following passage, Heidegger also reiterates the division of labor between thinking and faith, a division that needs to leave both realms strictly separated. And quote, thinking is foolishness for faith and the impossible is the faith for thinking. But both are united in their recognition of one another. Recognition consists in the demand by faith that thinking thinks, and in the demand by thinking, faith should be faith. Um, so, yeah. And at the beginning of this second note, Heidegger provides definitions of Christianity and, and Christianness. And let, let me just prepare this. Maybe I go to the board and, and write the terms down. To Thank you. So, uh, so I'm just, just writing the terms down, like the, the Danish, the German, the English, and uh, the Portuguese. Sorry for the one spelling mistake. So, it, um, so in, in Danish, it's, it's Christendom, and that means like the, the being Christian of the, um, of the single individual, like being a Christian, like Christendom, and Christenhelden is like the cultural manifestation. So, you know, like churches and, and, and all like the cultural traditional manifestations. And um, so Heidegger translated that in German as Christlichkeit and Christentum, which I think is like quite natural in German. Although you can say that, so you, ha you had to like use the other term in German, which might be confusing because like Christendom is like the, etymologically the same word as Christentum, but that's how it's, how it's pretty natural used in German. So I think Heidegger just you know, grasped the idea and used the right terms in German. And, and, but often um, it was translated similarly to English. So the Hong translation um, also uses like um, Christendom and Christianity here. But I think like the translation that the translators of Heidegger use makes much more sense to say that like, Christianness here and, and Christianity on this side. And I, I, and I got it right from like, your text that, so this is like the Portuguese. Um, terms, so you have, have that as a point of reference. So, and, and to prove that Heidegger had, in, in fact, like Kierkegaard's distinction in mind, um, there, there was a letter Heidegger sent um, in 1946 um, to a colleague, and there he explains that concerning Christianity, and I'm now following strictly like um, these, these terms and these translations. Concerning Christianity, there is for me, precisely as for Kierkegaard, an essential difference between Christianness, um, the faithfulness of the single individual, and Christianity as the historical, cultural, political manifestation of Christianity. Um, at the beginning of the note, um, Christianity and Christianness, Heidegger provides the following definition of the two terms. Christianity is metaphysics which presents Christian faith as knowledge. Christianness is faith in Christ. Uh, Christianness is faith in Christ in the figure of Christ. Um, the distinction um, has one brief appearance in Heidegger's published writings. On the occasion of the republication of his 1927 lecture, Phenomenology and Theology, which was in 1970, so when Heidegger was like more than 80 years old, 
um, he wrote like a short introductory, introductory note, and there he says that this little book might perhaps be able to occasion repeated reflection on the extent to which Christianness um, of Christianity and its theology merit questioning, but also on the extent to which philosophy, in particular that presented here, merits questioning. In this public statement, Heidi again emphasizes the clear division of labor between Christianity and, and philosophy, or between Christianness and philosophy. He uses philosophy here instead of thinking, and maybe this is just due to this text being public rather than an esoteric text, or maybe it's also because in the 70s he found like kind of reconciliation with, with philosophy um, as a term. Um, and he, but he himself is clearly on the side of philosophy or thinking, and as a consequent, Christianness cannot be of his concern. And this is also the main message in the note, Christianity and Christianness. Whoever thinks against Christianity does not think against Christianness. For there are two reasons um, why they cannot think against Christianness. For thinking, when it thinks against something, um, only has itself to think against. Furthermore, um, so he, he's playing with the word gegen in German, which uh, I, think, I think it's well done to, to render that in, in the English translation. Um, furthermore, as a consequence, because thinking as thinking is the fissure to faith, and because it has no need to begin thinking, uh, and because there's no need to be, begin thinking against faith, but it is essential to the fissure that it leaves both what is found on the one side and on the other side in its own peace. Faith and thinking are separated by a fissure that cannot be mediated. However, both have a common enemy, Christianity, the cultural manifestation of Christian faith. As a consequence, if thinking argues against Christianity, this doesn't imply an argument against Christianness. However, it is not an argument in favor of Christianness either, as Heidegger emphasizes in the following sentence. The label Christian remains ambiguous. It expresses either a, a relation to Christianity or a faith in Christ. Whoever speaks against the Christian must therefore speak ambiguously. When he speaks against the Christian as associated with Christianity, he is not yet speaking against the Christian in the sense of faith in Christ, but he is also not speaking for the latter. Um, Heidegger continues by stating that it would be a misunderstanding of one where to speak in favor of faith from, from the perspective of thinking. Faith does not require advocacy from thinking, and thinking cannot provide such advocacy. The alliance is only for the common opponent. But it could be necessary, and indeed even for the sake of thinking, to speak against the Christian in the sense of Christianity. In a mediated sense, um, this against could speak in support of faith through the fissure to the Christian in the sense of faith, and contrary to the will of thinking. Specifically, it could speak for faith that comes from Christ and not from theology. In several other entries, Heidegger emphasizes that his concern is thinking. His discussion of faith and thinking, Christianness and Christianity, served the purpose of clarifying the role of thinking. So it's not about faith, it's about explaining the role of thinking. Most importantly, um, Heidegger wants to introduce thinking as the successor after the end of philosophy. And compare this with the title of Heidegger's text um, for the conference Kierkegaard Vivant in 1963. The title of Heidegger's text is The End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking. Um, Heidegger puzzled the audience at this French conference in two ways. First, by not attending the conference and instead sending a paper to be read on his behalf. And second, um, by mentioning Kierkegaard not once in the paper. Um, this is quite striking for a conference that had the title of Kierkegaard Alive. Um, but for Heidegger, the end of philosophy is followed by thinking. Indeed, the end of philosophy is the task of thinking. And faith is not a solution to this problem, um, which is Heidegger's core concern. And Heidegger makes as much clear in another note um, from the Black Notebooks. The fact that one flees from philosophy to faith, or even just to theology, portrays the incapacity to be driven to despair with philosophy to be driven to despair precisely because, in its essence, it does not accomplish what it has been charged with, to think being. Despair with philosophy, however, does not propel one into, into flight to the other and into escape paths of our thinking. Um, despair and despair alone leads into thinking. 
And Heide continues this note um, with another allusion to, to Kierkegaard, this time to the book The Sickness Unto Death. Um, despair, however, is not the sickness unto death, rather the convalescence unto being, where convalescence expresses uh, nostos, so it's genesen in German, where I, I checked it in, in, in the Grimm Dictionary, and if you like, are very creative in, in reading like the, the German Dictionary of, of the Grimm's, then you can somehow find that, but you need to like, yeah, really, really mingle um, with, with the terms there. Um, so this um, convalescence expresses nostos, which then can be translated back as homecoming, and specifically homecoming as the turn into the event of oblivion, a homecoming which is simultaneously the return of the human being into mortality. So I refrain from interpreting this passage and instead conclude my explore, uh, exploration, exploration into the Black Notebooks with a last passage that displays another enigmatic allusion to Kierkegaard. To be a corrective, and to be one only in this realm, but not at all in the realms of faith, Christianness, and the church, and also not aesthetically, ethically, or religiously, and hence not metaphysically. Rather only in thinking, which precisely Kierkegaard first adopted in body and soul, as it were, without correction and without any reflection from his time, in order to thereby achieve his task to be a corrective, and thus at the same time to call attention to the corrective element to only for the attentive ones. Only being a corrective in thinking presents its own difficulties, for everyone thinks and takes himself to be a thinker, and for millennia, now metaphysics has even been confirming that to him. To be a corrective, and on top of that, to be a corrective to those who have made thinking their profession, and I especially obdurate for that very reason. That is the most difficult thing. So in a certain sense, Heidegger appears to suggest um, that Kierkegaard can serve as a role model for him. Um, the difference is um, that Heidegger sees himself not in the same realm as Kierkegaard. So Heidegger sees Kierkegaard's role in def um, defending Christianness against Christianity, and he sees his own role in defending thinking against metaphysics. Thus he concludes that what he might learn from Kierkegaard is nothing in the content of his thought, it is rather the way in which Kierkegaard fought his fight. He identifies Kierkegaard's way of being a corrective as a potential role model. Um, so this passage makes me wonder once more whether uh, this contains a meaningful thought or whether it's more of a mystification or heroization on Heidegger's part. Because like, if you read like, the context in the Black Notebooks, they're full of notes that reveal Heidegger as being rather thin-skinned, often presenting himself as a victim of various attacks and conspiracies. Um, moreover, there are several entries um, in which Heidegger places himself in mythological succe successions. So the passage cited in the introduction listing Sch Schiller, Hölderlin, Van Gogh, and Nietzsche as these enigmatic signs. It's like one of these examples where Heidegger like, draws these um, mythological lines in the underground of the history of, of thinking. Um, and not surprisingly, that remark from the introduction can be found um, identically um, in the Black Notebooks. So that was a passage most likely from the Black Notebooks that Heidegger so used for his lecture courses. Um, good, final section. Um, I'm afraid that this tour through the Black Notebooks has brought me quite far away from the topic I set out to explore, which was Heidegger's view on Kierkegaard as a Christian writer. To conclude my talk, I want to come back to Heidegger's second lecture course on Schelling. Heidegger states in this lecture course that Kierkegaard's critique of Hegel works only at the cost that he renounces philosophy altogether and solely exists as a believer. This is a thought we are already familiar with. Kierkegaard does not belong to the history of metaphysics. In other words, he is neither a philosopher nor a theologian in terms of these traditions. As a consequence, Heidegger can write that the biggest misunderstanding regarding Kierkegaard is utilizing him for a Christian philosophy. But Kierkegaard does not follow Heidegger's project either, that is the project of thinking the history of being in preparation for its overcoming. Kierkegaard is neither a theologian or philosopher nor a thinker, he's a believer. Um, this could be a good conclusion to Heidegger's narrative in this lecture course and also to my presentation. Heidegger, however, adds another wrinkle to this story. He says, 
Kierkegaard, however, did not exist as an unknown faithful Christian who somewhere follows his day's work and his occupation. He does not even have one and does not want to have one. He rather exists as a writer. He thinks and writes and communicates and intervenes in the disputes of the day. He thought of his time, the thought of his time gets powerful in him, and he thereby realizes a unique sojourn of self-examination within the 19th century. He becomes one who cannot be ignored, whether one is a follower or an enemy or just indifferent towards him. This passage hints towards a way of speaking about Kierkegaard as a Christian writer in a pronounced sense. Although Kierkegaard was a faithful Christian, he did not choose to live a life as an anonymous, devoted Christian. He decided to become a writer who defended Christianness in the age of Christianity. This talk has been organized around the question, what made Kierkegaard, in Heidegger's view, the only religious writer who accords with the destiny of his age? Maybe the answer is as simple as it can get. Kierkegaard's unique position is characterized by what he said about himself in the point of view of my work as an author. That he was a religious author who reminded his fellows of the issue of Christianness, the task of becoming Christian against the background of Christianity, that is the assumption that everyone already is a Christian. Um, and maybe this was indeed the, the destiny of the second half of the 19th century in Europe. Um, and Heidegger identified Machenschaft or Gestell as the destiny of the 20th century. And if we want to talk in such terms, um, the destiny of the 21st century remains to be seen. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Nós temos ainda tempo, se vocês quiserem fazer algumas perguntas, pode ser em inglês, pode ser em alemão, se for preciso pode ser em português, e aí talvez o Eduardo nos ajude um pouco. Eu só peço que quem fizer pergunta faça ao microfone aqui. E que faça devagar para que possa ser traduzido. Hi, hello. Um, it's not probably a very, very important question, but I didn't understand exactly why did Heidegger said that um, thinking goes against philosophy? Can you explain me? Yeah, I think this is mostly a matter of terminology. So, so what, what, what Heidegger wants to show is that, you know, the tra tradition of thought um, that it was prevalent in, in both philosophy and theology, so he labels it metaphysics, um, you know, uh, um, is like a long history of what he calls the oblivion of being, so a long history of, with the terminology of being and time, of fallenness. So, you know, originally there was, so, so if, if you like, want to explain it in like terms of like, uh, phenomenology as in the early Heidegger, his idea was that originally there, there was an experience um, that you know, was really an, ex an encounter um, with the matter at hand, um, but through you know, the, the history of thought, um, you know, kind of we, we lost that touch with, with the original experience that you know, created that idea, um, and it just you know, turned into what Heidegger would call idle talk and so on. So, um, kind of we've, we lost that contact and that, that's his idea um, about fallenness and, and the oblivion of being that um, you know, we, we, we lost this original experience and instead um, only could experience entities in like these this certain ways. And that's why at, at a certain point in, um, in his intellectual development, which was like mostly in the 30s and 40s, um, he would say that what, what he's doing or what he's preparing is not philosophy anymore. Um, and he, he labels it thinking, but the idea is just um, we, we need to um, kind of see through and, and overcome um, this tradition that for him like, is not able to, to address um, the question of being because it's already disclosed with, within a scheme that he um, labels it as framing. I think I understood. Thanks.
Well, uh, thank you very much. But, uh, well, I, I'm not a great uh, scholar about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm from another perspective, but I'm very curious about some aspects of your, of your talk. One of them uh, tells about the, the, well, we know that for, for Heidegger, uh, there is a, um, a relationship between thinking and poetry. Okay, the, the overcoming of metaphysics uh, marks uh, a special uh, glimpse uh, to poetry. It, what, what could be the, the, the Heidegger's view about the, the, poet, uh, the, the poetical uh, expression of Christianness? Or, yeah? uh, this this, this uh, is, is the first question. And the second one, I'm curious about the, the Van Gogh norm in this list. Uh, could you uh, tell us about uh, why Van Gogh is among uh, the other names? Yeah, Rick, like I, I don't have answers to, to any of the two questions. Like the second one, I, I really have no idea. Uh, like I, I also couldn't find like other passages that would, would help illuminate that issue. I mean, of, of course, there's, I mean, the, 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 the one thing one could, could point out is um, in, in um, um, Heidegger's um, um, text on, on like, uh, the work of arts, I mean, he, he's referring to the, the shoes from Gauch, and probably like this, this is the connection where one could, could look into, um, but, but I don't have any better answer than, than maybe that idea. Um, that, that's the connection. Um, yeah, regarding thinking and, and poetry, um, I think there we can really see like Heidegger's limitation. So that, you know, he has this very narrow sense of, you know, what a poet is. And, and, a, um, and a poet is, is, is basically um, the one who like gives a language to a people's so there are only very few like real poets, and you know somehow Homer was the poet for the Greeks, and Hölderlin was the poet for for the Germans. Uh, so he has this you know very specific notion of, of of what a poet is. But yeah, one one thing I was also always wondering because like uh, his main concern is um, like deconstructing um, the history of metaphysics, which started in in ancient Greek thought. Um, like why he would never like in uh, kind of um, with the idea of um, you know finding resources for this um, deconstruction would look into other origins um, of occidental thought and then like one like obvious origin would be um, to to look into the uh, um, Hebraic tradition of, of mono uh, uh, yeah, of, of like this tradition, and, and and of course it would then like be, and and he did that a bit in his very early works, where um, he looks into um, um, like early Christianity, um, but he never picks that up later, and that's also one of the things that puzzles me about his um, remarks about um, Jews, that he's like only taking them in in these terms of cultural prejudices, and never asks that actually you know there's also a um, Hebraic tra tradition um, um, that could be a resource for criticizing um, like the history of being in um, in, in um, the, the philosophical sense like like Levinas for example would do that but but that never occurred to Heidegger it seems uh, eu queria acrescentar uma observação ele falou de Christian Ness yeah? Uh, a gente pode imaginar o ser cristão, Christ Sein, diferenciando da doutrina, do ensino, da, da mensagem e também das instituições cristãs, né, do aspecto exterior do cristianismo. Mas, então, o ser cristão, o modo de ser cristão seria o que eu traduzo por cristicidade, né? E uh, o mér um mérito do Kierkegaard seria de ter escolhido uma terceira palavra entre cristandade e cristianismo, né? Uh, uma terceira. Uh, 
Eu queria acrescentar Christian Salvation, para mim soa muito, muito mal, mas no original, Gerhard me chamou a atenção, é, é Christ, Christlich Heil. Né? Heil é uma palavra que tem vários significados. Né? É, é, viva, se for uma saudação, viva, ou então... É, felicidade, né? Zelig sein, Heil, né? estar bem, é Heil também, uh, estar curado de uma doença, é Heil, né? gesund, né? geheilt, né? curado. Então, uh, a gente não deve pensar, quando fala salvação cristã, assim, uma coisa lá do outro mundo, né? mas é um uh, canal... Heil kann auch äh, das Ganze bedeuten, ja, o, o, quer dizer, o, a, a vida integral, né, o, um ser inteiro. Né, então, não é simplesmente uma coisa lá para o outro mundo que, que o cristão está querendo fugir de uma vez. Né, então, essa é uma das dificuldades de, de traduzir a partir do inglês depois. Né, mas é... é Yeah, so in, in, in Danish, yeah, in, in Danish yeah. you have like uh, heal and healer, which is like the same term, I think, which, which the English whole is. Um, yeah. Hi. Heidegger said that uh, abstract thinking is remote thinking. And I got a little confused about that. I couldn't really get it. Could you speak a little more about that? Abstract thinking is a remote thinking. So, yeah, so what, what, what Heidegger uh, does there in, in his lecture course um, is, is trying to um, like explain the relation between Kierkegaard and, and Hegel. And, and his idea there is that they charge each other with like, thinking abstractly. And, and Heidegger tries to explain to his students there what like thinking abstractly means for, for Hegel and, and for Kierkegaard, respectively. And um, so, and um, Heidegger explains it in this way that he says that, um, so for Hegel, um, thinking concretely means like to think an entity in its entire um, complexity of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So not like only one sided, one side, but you know, thesis, the antithesis, and synthesis, and and that and so thinking abstractly when you know that charge comes from Hegel means thinking one-sided, and and he says that but for Kierkegaard, um, thinking abstractly means something different. Um, it means not not thinking um, concrete existence, um, not not thinking actuality. Um, And, and that's what, what I tried to, to render as um, remote thinking, because it's like thinking that is removed um, from this fear of actuality. Um, I, I, this is one of the points where I, I don't feel like I'm competent enough in, in, in Hegel in particular, but to a certain extent also in, in Kierkegaard, to like really charge whether um, Heidegger's attempt to like pin down the relation of, of Hegel and Kierkegaard like is a good one or helpful one or not, um, but m like my, my hope is like you know pointing to these passages in the lecture course that people who know. Não, mas não é bem pergunta, só para uma colocação assim. Eu estudei um semestre foi com o professor Álvaro sobre Heidegger, sobre filosofia da religião. E nós estudamos um pouco sobre Heidegger, muito sobre Heidegger, e um pouco sobre o Kierkegaard. Né? E eu confesso assim, que foi o filósofo que eu mais me identifiquei, assim, que eu mais me aprofundei, assim, e... até mesmo porque agora estou fazendo estágio numa escola e estou falando sobre existencialismo em Kierkegaard. E achei interessante porque eu vejo que ele foi um que ele buscou muito conhecimento muita sabedoria assim e eu li também que ele não se, não se, não se considerava um filósofo 
e também não é um cristão, porque ele não se identificava com, com os crentes da época, né? Que ele, que ele, não, se, que ele não, se, não se considerou um, um cristão por causa dos crentes da época ali, né? E uma vez ele também uma pessoa assim, um pensador que contribuiu muito com a comunidade com seus pensamentos sobre existencialismo, né? Sobre sobre o ser, sobre né, a pessoa, né? Sobre a nossa existência, como nós existimos, né? Também sobre uh, os três estágios, três estágios da existência, que é o estético, o ético e o religioso, que tudo vem pelo salto, salto da fé, né? Por por ouvir, né? A Deus, por ouvir, né? Falar de Deus. E esse salto da fé, eu entendo também como diz uh, Agostinho, quanto mais fé, mais, pens, uh, mais uh, quanto mais fé, mais razão que que Agostinho não houvesse a separação entre fé e, e, e razão, né? E quanto mais fé, mais busca pela sabedoria e sabedoria que é Cristo, né? Que é que é Deus, né? E, e, e também outro ponto importante que eu acho de Kiger, que ele fala a questão da subjetividade, né? Que uma experiência uh, individual, né? Uma experiência uh, su, su, subjetiva, que ele fala. Né? Então uh, a gente não sabe a experiência que ele teve para escrever aqueles seus textos, né? Mas, mas essa parte que a gente tem que ver em conta é que cada um tem a sua intimidade com a sabedoria, com, com Deus. Né? So, so may, may, maybe um, to to like contextualize what I was talking here I was talking like of the, the period of Heidegger, like second half of the 1930s and 40s, um, which was quite different from the the early Heidegger. Um, in this course, like from the beginning of the 20s. Um, and, and I think there in, in this course on, on phenomenology of religious life, and we can um, see that like the quotes um, Heidegger uses from, from Augustine um, are, are like most, uh, like, uh, and, and also like there he, use, he has a few quotations of Kierkegaard in, in this context of his interpretation of Augustine, and they are all regarding the, the question of selfhood um, and being a self. Um, and and it's, inter it's interesting to note that um, just the years before, um, Heidegger began reading Jaspers, um, and um, what I tried to show is that probably Heidegger's first engagement with Kierkegaard was um, via Jaspers. So Heidegger um, began writing Jaspers, and Jaspers has this um, report on Kierkegaard and uses a lot of Kierkegaardian concepts. And, and Heidegger probably got familiar with Kierkegaard through reading Jaspers. And it's clear that the idea is there um, that the question is how to um, anal analyze and understand um, structures of, of existence. Um, and, and Heidegger's main claim there is that, you know, Jaspers analyzes the right phenomena, um, but he does so in a totally misleading way. And Kierkegaard, which Jaspers draws on, was actually smarter than Jaspers because Kierkegaard understood like the difficulties um, of analyzing structures of existence. So Heidegger thinks that you know, he can learn methodologically um, from Kierkegaard for his own project of, of understanding um, what human existence is about. Um, so, and I think this was Heidegger's project like in these years, 21, 23, 24, he wanted to understand human existence and what being a self means. Um, but I think already it turned to, to being in time um, meant that Heidegger moved a bit away from that project um, of understanding um, selfhood and towards uh, another ontological project. Um, and I think th th this is when, when he departed from, from the project um, that Jaspers followed and through which he, he got his first engagement with Kierkegaard. Fischer, yeah. 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 um comentário Yeah. Yeah. Eu queria só para o pessoal mais novo talvez comentar que eu já dei 
depois que eu li o livro dele, já pesquisei mais um pouco também, quer dizer, através do Santo Agostinho, no, quer dizer, Heidegger conhece Kierkegaard através de Cariaspas, do livro de 1919, Psicologia das Visões de Mundo. Então, aí o Jasper estava encantado com Kierkegaard, chega a dar assim 10, 12 páginas de citações seguidas, né? e é exatamente esse Kierkegaard que o Heidegger começa a mencionar naquele momento, né? nos anos 19, 20 e 21. Faz um comentário de 44 páginas ao livro do Jaspers, que ele até pensou em publicar como uma recensão ou como um livro, talvez, né? mas uh, começa imediatamente, depois da Fenomenologia da Vida Religiosa, no próximo semestre ele dá um curso sobre Santo Agostinho, e ali ele começa a enfiar citações de Kierkegaard, mas colocando na, na sequência assim, do pensamento da, da interioridade, né, do ser eu mesmo, né, a self-hood, né, na linha agostiniana. Né, e, para quem conhece um pouco mais Kierkegaard, ele se baseia, então, mais na doença para a morte, né, que é um, uma espécie de uma teoria do self. Né, mas, mais adiante, no livro do Gerd, aparece muitas vezes, né, Heidegger faz sequências, né? Antes ele fazia Paulo, Agostinho, Lutero, Kierkegaard, né? mas aí ele faz outro tipo de sequência, a filosofia da existência, vamos dizer, Schelling, depois Kierkegaard como centrando a existência, já não é mais aquela existência escolástica, né? uh, essência e existência, agora em, em Schelling, existência é uma coisa mais específica, em Kierkegaard é o tornar-se eu mesmo, tornar-se cristão, em Cariaspers, isto é repetido, mas agora secularizado, sem o cristão, tornar-se eu mesmo, e aí depois vem Ser e Tempo, Being in Time, né? uh, o autor de Ser e Tempo já não está interessado exatamente nesta existência, está apenas... Uh, investigando o Dasein para chegar à questão do ser. E, quando ele faz esses comentários, ele já não é mais o autor de Ser e Tempo, ele já é o filósofo do ser. Né? Então, isso seria importante. Como tu insististe esse aspecto da existência em Kierkegaard, uh, quem lê os textos do Gerd Weg, com toda a razão eles põem isso, né? que... Heidegger se distancia dessa problemática, do, até a problemática do Dasein, depois dos anos 30. Né? Então, aí eles se distanciam bastante. Né? Das war nur eine, eine Zusammenfassung, auch von, von deinem Buch in diesen Stellen. Ne? Bitte, Klaus. Dr. Tonhauser, it's a pleasure to meet you personal and listen to you uh, about your, your studies and this very interesting title, A New Outlook. I, I have seen that many times and in many, in many readings about uh, what Heidegger thinks about Kierkegaard, um, that uh, there are different uh, ideas about what he thinks about Kierkegaard. So I think also, and I, I have seen in the readings I, I did about that, that many times there is a Heidegger very emotion, or, uh, proud about himself, and you know, uh, what you, you, you talk about also. But uh, I see also that Heidegger uh, has different views of Kierkegaard and uh, when he is looking for different interests in his uh, studies. And I have a small question, but I'm very interested in that because I really don't know what is really, really the point of Heidegger with Kierkegaard. What is really the point? Uh, and he's, he writes, uh, about Kierkegaard as a Christian, 
and uh, as a philosopher, or uh, not a philosopher, but a Christian thinker. And, but I think there is another point. It's, it's, it's a point um, maybe more, um, well, I don't know what is the, the idea, but what is really the point of Heidegger in Kierkegaard's uh, philosophy? Can you help me that? And you talk. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that I can give an answer that satisfies you. Um, but, but mostly what I tried to show in, in the book is that, that we cannot give one answer to that question. Um, because um, what, what Kierkegaard meant to Heidegger like changed with Heidegger's interests. Um, and you know, as, as Heidegger's interests changed, um, his, his relations to like a lot of, of figures in the tradition changed and also to, to Kierkegaard. Um, so and, and, and I, I try to distinguish various periods where I think that like the, the early period, like, like 1920 to 1923, I mean, that was the period when, when he gave the, um, the lecture on um, phenomenology of, of religious life, where, where I think that Kierkegaard really is, like, served as a resource for him. So he was you know, trying to find his own way of, of thinking and you know, getting a grasp of, of the issues. And they are, they are, I think Kierkegaard really served as a resource. Um, where, where together with Jaspers and many others, Aristotle and so on, like they were, they were really resources. So he was searching for you know, his own, own way of, of, of thinking, approaching the, um, the, the problem of existence and, and use these thinkers as, as resources. Um, Whereas uh, as soon as he like kind of found like his his way of, of approaching the issue, so with like the first drafts of being in time, he, he didn't need these resources anymore. So you know he kind of you know lifted himself above, and, and then you know for a long time, um, I don't think that there was really much much engagement um, with Kierkegaard. And, and interestingly enough. Um, you know, where, where I didn't expect it when, when I started um, with this project in, into Heidegger's um, relation to, to Kierkegaard. Like, he came back to him, like, in the 1940s, um, and that's what I tried to, to present you today. But, but it's really hard to say what, what, like, why he came back to, to Kierkegaard, because it appears in all these statements that there's a certain, like, distance that doesn't really allow him to, you know, like engage with Kierkegaard on like, you know, this, the same height. Like he's, he's more like, you know, looking down on all these figures and like kind of puts them in order in his, um, his history um, uh, of thought. And it, it, it doesn't seem like that there's kind of a, a form of engagement that, you know, really tries to, you know, take important matters out of these fingers. It's, it's more like, you know, putting them in order. Um, so so I, I, think it, I think it really, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's why it's so important to, like, when you have these statements, like, try to contextualize, like, what, what, what was, was Heidegger, like, up to at that period? And then it makes it easier to grasp, like, why he's saying this or that. Uh. Só é, só é merra com o da Bahia. Eu queria acrescentar dois, duas pequenas observações. O próprio Heidegger define o seu pensar mais como caminho. Né? Sein Denken ist, möchte er mehr als Wege, als Laufen, als, als eine Theorie. Né? E o segundo... É, segundo eu vou esquecer. <risos> Depois eu vejo. Desculpa, bom, é, era esse aspecto assim do ele ele cita no começo mais Kierkegaard, uh, mas ele ele está tentando achar outras maneiras de pensar. Né? Eu não vou resumir aqui, né? não, é só é, eu queria chamar a atenção esse aspecto. Né? O próprio Heidegger se ah segunda segundo ponto uh, Vocês sabem que eu leio Kierkegaard há muitos anos, né? 
professor Gerard ainda não tinha nascido, eu já estava com meu tese de doutorado sobre Kierkegaard, e eu gostei muito de algumas observações, às vezes o Heidegger faz assim uma observação final, né? por exemplo, me chamou muita atenção aquela que a grandeza de Kierkegaard estaria nisto, e aí ele diz assim, se é que falar assim já não é uma má compreensão, ou seja, Kierkegaard está se lixando para a sua grandeza, para a sua é, colocação no mundo, isso aí não interessa a Kierkegaard, né? então o, o Heidegger percebe isto, né? ele, ele ele, ao mesmo tempo que ele elogia ou tenta colocar Kierkegaard numa certa história, ao mesmo tempo ele diz, mas Kierkegaard não cabe nessa história. <risos> então, isso aí é um prazer de ver. Né? Mais uma pergunta, talvez? Eu vou pedir para o professor Eduardo me ajudar. É, bom, uh, eu estou fazendo o meu... começando o meu projeto de TCC, é, de conclusão agora do curso de filosofia e o, o assunto do meu do meu trabalho é a fenomenologia da vida religiosa eu vou utilizar Heidegger uh, Kierkegaard Santo Agostinho a princípio e uh, tem uma questão assim que eu queria fazer uma pergunta porque foi foi falado durante a palestra a respeito do, do livro Ser e Tempo que eu vou que eu pretendo utilizar e o fato do Ser e Tempo ser uh, ateísta para algumas pessoas têm essa essa visão de ser ateísta. Então, eu queria saber do professor se ele acha, dentro do ponto de vista dele, se ele acha que é possível utilizar, a, a, a pensar essa cristicidade que ele quer falar, né? uh, tendo como base o livro Ser e Tempo, mesmo tendo esse, apesar de não ser um trabalho teológico, sim um trabalho filosófico, mas uh, se existe, se eu vou conseguir ter sucesso nessa minha empreitada ou se ele acha dentro do ponto de vista dele se ele acha viável isso. Well, it's a, it's a long question, but <laughs> she, she is working with uh, uh, the phenomenal phenomenological aspects of uh, religious uh, experience, okay? In his uh, paper for the for the final papers in the in the, in the, in the course. And, and she is looking for uh, some aspects of this phenomenological uh, reading of religious experience in being time. But being time is a uh, atheist, atheistic book, she thinks. Okay, and, and and then she asking about the well, how could she read about these aspects in Heidegger text? Uh, supposing that this being time is an atheist view about being. I will the question. So I'm, I'm finding my way around the question, or around answering the question. Um, so uh, regarding atheism, um, there are several um, um, passages where um, Heidegger says that um, he is following a methodological atheism. Um, so, uh, so, so that means like it's not atheistic in, in the sense of being, being like against religion. It's just that he says from a methodological point of view, um, if you want to do um, philosophy, then, you know, you cannot have um, theological presuppositions. And this is basically just his idea of, you know, like s trying to, like, deconstruct all presuppositions um, to, to achieve, like, um, this, this uh, presuppositionlessness. Um, so, so, so the attempt of being in time is being neutral on this question. Um, and that, that's, I think, the sense of methodological atheism. Um, I, I think, and, and then I think what concretely could be interesting is um, um, Heidegger's talk, um, what was it called? Was it called Phenomenology and, and Theology, I think? Um, 
because when, when Heidegger wrote Being in Time, um, he, he was in Marburg and he, he closely um, um, cooperated with, with Rudolf Bultmann. And, and Bultmann might be interesting because what Bultmann does is like applying um, the framework of being in time um, for um, purposes of Protestant theology. And, and there's like one public lecture where Heidegger was like speaking on invitation of Bultmann about what, how he himself thinks that you can use being in time um, for that purpose. Um, so so that, that's where I would, would go um, in studying that issue. I, I have a last one. Uh, and the question is about the, well, uh, the idea of return to mortality that you talk about and, uh, and the, the relationship uh, about this idea to return, uh, the uh, idea of return to mortality and the overcoming of metaphysics, okay? But what, what is the, exactly the, the relationship between the idea of return to mortality and overcoming of metaphysics in Heidegger's, okay? Uh, I, I think is is well, for me, is completely, almost completely new uh, here a conference about Heidegger, and <laughs> And I think is a long answer. I think. Um, yeah, I mean, the, like the the passage in w in which this 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 phrase um, appears is is the one where where yeah, Heidegger already plays with this um, yeah um, quite creative etymolo etymology to like get to to the point, um, but but. So, so I guess it would be like a, a talk on its on on its own um, to like spell out what what he actually means there, because I mean he's obviously playing on on the idea of of in in Kierkegaard's the sickness unto death, where like death obviously is like like not what 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 the sickness like unto death is, but you know it's not a despair which where you're very much alive, but you in in that sense of being in despair um, and dead, and and I think uh, Heidegger plays on on that thought there, and um, has the idea that like returning to proper understanding of the human being, um, out of proper understanding of what it means to like be in the world and be related to to the question of being means to understand oneself. Um, as finite, uh, mortal, and so on. Um, so, so this is the, the general line, line of thought, but uh, I, I tried in, in, in several of, of my texts to talk, to, to understand what finitude like, means both for, um, for, for Heidegger and, and for Kierkegaard. It's, uh, it's quite complicated. Um, but, but in this case, there is a, a, a source for this idea of finitude in the sickness uh, unto death? No, I, I, think, no? I think he's distancing himself by, by saying that uh, for Kierkegaard, like, uh, the idea is not, uh, is not finitude because it's about overcoming oh, okay. despair. Okay. Uh, so, and, and that's why he's saying that you know, it, it's precisely not the sickness unto death or overcoming the sickness unto death in the sense of, of Kierkegaard, but instead, like, um, returning to an understanding of um, myself, ourselves, as finite beings. So embracing finitude. Podemos, então, concluir essa nossa noitada. Uh, estamos muito agradecidos ao professor uh, Gerhard. E vejam, assim como Kierkegaard e Heidegger diferenciam entre cristianismo e cristandade e o ser cristão, assim também vale para a instituição acadêmica. Nem sempre o grande professor, que tem muito a ensinar, é um real professor já, <risos> um full professor. Né? Ou seja, não é preciso ser um professor alemão para saber ter muito a comunicar, muito a dar, e por isso nós estamos muito agradecidos. Né? Ah, não quer dizer que 
que o Gerhard Tonehaus, o doutor em filosofia, não esteja já na carreira universitária e num ponto muito alto na Universidade Livre de Berlim, mas esperamos que ele se mantenha sempre disponível né, para contribuir, compartilhar com o seu saber, para que nós também possamos crescer. Muito obrigado, professor. Danke, professor.